Hello friends and welcome to my channel. In this video we will be learning about the pharynx. To begin with, the pharynx is a wide muscular tube situated behind the nose, the mouth and the larynx. The upper part of the pharynx transmits only air. The lower part transmits only food and the middle part is a common passage for both air and food. Now looking at the dimensions of the pharynx, the length is 12 cm, the width in the upper part which is the widest is 3.5 cm, middle part is narrow and the lower end is the narrowest. Now looking at the boundaries of the pharynx, superiorly it is bounded by the base of the skull, inferiorly it is continuous with the esophagus at the level of the sixth cervical vertebra. Posteriorly, it glides freely on the prevertebral fascia which separates it from the cervical vertebral bodies. Anteriorly, it communicates with the nasal ca cavity, the oral cavity and the larynx. Moving on to the parts of the pharynx, the cavity of the pharynx is divided into the nasal part which is called the nasopharynx, the oral part which is called the oropharynx and the laryngeal part which is called the laryngopharynx. Concising the important points under the introduction to the pharynx, the pharynx is a wide muscular tube situated behind the nose, the mouth and the larynx. The upper part of the pharynx transmits only air, the lower part only food and the middle part is a common passage for both air and food. Looking at the dimensions of the pharynx, the length is 12 cm, width in the upper part is the widest that is 3.5 cm, in the middle part it is narrow and in the lower part it is narrowest. Looking at the boundaries of the pharynx, superiorly it is bounded by the base of the skull, inferiorly it is bounded by it is continuous with the esophagus at the level of the sixth cervical vertebra. Posteriorly it glides freely on the prevertebral fascia which separates it from the cervical vertebral body. Anteriorly, it communicates with the nasal cavity, the oral cavity and the larynx. Now let's learn about the nasopharynx. It is situated behind the nose. It extends from the base of the skull to the soft palate that you see right here. It communicates anteriorly with the nose and below with the oropharynx. The nerve supply is by the pharyngeal branch of the pterygopalatine ganglia. Now let's look at the relations of the nasopharynx. Anteriorly it is related to the posterior nasal aperture. Posteriorly it is related to the body of the sphenoid bone. And lateral wall it is related to the opening of the auditory tube. The nasopharynx is lined by ciliated columnar epithelium. Its function is passage for air. That is it has a respiratory function. Now concising the important points under the parts of the pharynx, the cavity of the pharynx is divided into the nasal part that is the nasopharynx, the oral part that is the oropharynx and the laryngeal part that is the laryngopharynx. Let's learn about the nasopharynx. It is situated behind the nose. It extends from the base of the skull to the soft palate. It communicates anteriorly with the nose and below with the oropharynx. Nerve supply is by the pharyngeal branch of the pterygopalatine ganglia. Looking at its relations, its anterior relation is the posterior nasal aperture, posterior relation is the body of the sphenoid bone and the lateral wall is opening of the auditory tube. It is lined by ciliated columnar epithelium. Its function is passage for air that is it has a respiratory function. Now let's learn about the oropharynx that is the second part of the pharynx. It is situated behind the oral cavity. It extends from the soft palate above right here to the upper border of the epiglottis below. It communicates anteriorly with the oral cavity, above with the nasopharynx and below with the laryngopharynx. Its nerve supply is by the 9th and 10th cranial nerves. Now let's look at its relations. Anteriorly, it is related to the oral cavity. Posteriorly, it is related to the body of the second and third cervical vertebra. And the lateral wall is related to the tonsilla fossa containing palatine tonsils. 
the oropharynx is lined by stratified squamous non-keratinized epithelium. Its function is passage for air and food. Concising the important points under the oropharynx, it is situated behind the oral cavity. It extends from the soft palate to upper border of epiglottis. It communicates anteriorly with the oral cavity, above with the nasopharynx and below with the laryngopharynx. Nerve supply is by the 9th and 10th cranial nerves. Looking at the relations, anteriorly it is related to the oral cavity, posteriorly to the body of the 2nd and 3rd cervical vertebra and the lateral wall is related to the tonsilla fossa containing palatine tonsils. It is aligned by stratified squamous, non-keratinized epithelium. The function is passage for air and food. Now let's learn about the laryngopharynx. The laryngopharynx is situated behind the larynx. It extends from the upper body of the epiglottis to the lower border of the cricoid cartilage right here. It communicates inferiorly with the esophagus, anteriorly with the larynx and above with the oropharynx. Its nerve supply is by the 9th and 10th cranial nerves. Now looking at its relations, anteriorly it is related to the inlet of the larynx, the posterior surface of the cricoid cartilage and the arytenoid cartilage. Posteriorly it is related to the 4th and 5th cervical vertebra and the lateral wall is related to the piriform fossa on each side of the inlet of the larynx bounded by epiglottic fold medially and thyroid cartilage laterally. The laryngopharynx is lined by stratified squamous non-keratinized epithelium and its function is passage for foot. Concising the points under the laryngopharynx, it is situated behind the larynx. It extends from the upper body of the epiglottis to lower border of cricoid cartilage. It communicates inferiorly with the esophagus, anteriorly with the larynx and above with the oropharynx. The nerve supply is by the 9th and 10th cranial nerves. Looking at the relations, anteriorly it is related to the inlet of the larynx, posterior surface of the cricoid cartilage and the arytenoid cartilage. Posteriorly it is related to the 4th and 5th cervical vertebra and lateral wall is related to the piriform fossa on each side of the inlet of the larynx bounded by epiglottic fold medially and thyroid cartilage laterally. It is lined by stratified squamous, non-keratinized epithelium and its function is passage for foot. Now let's learn about the structure of the pharynx through this diagram. The wall of the pharynx is composed of five layers from within to outwards. First is the mucosa shown in pink. Second is the submucosa which is the white layer. Third is the pharyngobasilar fascia which is shown in green. It is a fibrous sheet internal to the pharyngeal muscles. It is thickest in its upper end and posteriorly where it forms the pharyngeal raphe. Superiorly, it is attached to the basi occiput, the petrous temporal bone, the auditory tube and inferiorly, it is deep to the muscles. Moving on to the fourth layer which is the muscular coat. It consists of outer circular layer made up of three constrictors that is the superior constrictor, the middle constrictor and the inferior constrictor. The inner longitudinal layer is made up of stylopharynges, salpingopharynges and palatopharynges muscles. Finally, there is the buccopharyngeal fascia shown in green which covers the outer surface of the constrictors of the pharynx and extends forward across the pterygomandibular raphe to cover the buccinator muscle. Concising the important points under the structure of the pharynx, the wall of the pharynx is composed of the following five layers from within outwards. First is the mucosa, submucosa, pharyngobasilar fascia, muscular coat and buccopharyngeal fascia. Looking at the pharyngobasilar fascia, it is a pharyngeal aponeurosis. It is a fibrous sheet internal to the pharyngeal muscles. It is thickest in the upper part and posteriorly where it forms the pharyngeal raphe. Superiorly, it is attached to the big CO occiput the petrous temporal bone, auditory tube and inferiorly it is deep to the muscles. Moving on to the muscular coat, it consists of outer circular layer made up of three constrictors, superior, middle and inferior constrictor. The inner longitudinal layer is made up of stylopharynges, salpingopharynges and palatopharynges muscles. 
Finally, the buccal pharyngeal fascia. It covers the outer surface of the constrictors of the pharynx and extends forwards across the pterygomandibular raphe to cover the buccinator muscle. Now let's learn about the muscles of the pharynx. It is formed mainly by three pairs of constrictors, the superior, the middle and the inferior constrictor. The origin of the constrictors are situated anteriorly in relation to the posterior openings of the nose, mouth and tongue. The inferior muscle overlaps the middle muscle, the middle in turn overlaps the superior muscle. Now let's look at the origin of the constrictors. Firstly, the superior constrictor takes origin from the pterygoid hamilus, the pterygomandibular raphe, the medial surface of the mandible and the side of the posterior part of the tongue. The middle constrictor that you see right here takes origin from the lower part of the stylohyoid ligament, the lesser cornua of the hyoid bone and the greater cornua of the hyoid bone. The inferior constrictor has two parts, a thyropharyngeal part and a cricopharyngeal part. The thyropharyngeal part of the inferior constrictor arises from the oblique line on the lamina of the thyroid cartilage, the tendinous band that crosses the cricothyroid muscle and the inferior cornua of the thyroid cartilage. The cricopharyngeal part of the inferior constrictor arises from the cricoid cartilage behind the origin of the cricothyroid muscle. Now looking at the points under the muscles of the pharynx, it is formed mainly by three pairs of constrictors, superior, middle and inferior constrictor. The origin of the constrictors are situated anteriorly in relation to the posterior openings of the nose, the mouth and the larynx. The inferior overlaps the middle, which in turn overlaps the superior constrictor. Looking at the origin of constrictors, the superior constrictor takes origin from the following. The pterygoid hamilus, the pterygomandibular raphe, medial surface of the mandible and the side of the posterior part of the tongue. The middle constrictor takes origin from the lower part of the stylohyoid ligament, the lesser cornua of the hyoid bone, the upper border of the greater cornua of the hyoid bone. The inferior constrictor has two parts the thyropharynges and the cricopharynges. Thyropharynges arises from the oblique line on the lamina of the thyroid cartilage, tendinous band that crosses the cricothyroid muscle and inferior cornua of the thyroid Now cartilage. let's look at the insertion of the constrictors of the pharynx. This is the superior constrictor, the middle constrictor and the inferior constrictor. So they are inserted into a median raphe on the posterior wall of the pharynx. The upper end of the raphe reaches the base of the skull. Finally, let's learn about the longitudinal muscle coat of the pharynx. The pharynx has three muscles that run longitudinally. First is the stylopharynges that arises from the styloid process as you can see right here. Second is the palatopharynges that descends from the sides of the palate. Third is the salpingopharynges that descends from the auditory tube to merge with the palatopharyngeus. Do you see right here? This is the auditory tube. Looking at the insertion of constrictors, all the constrictors of the pharynx are inserted into a median raphe on the posterior wall of the pharynx. Looking at the longitudinal muscle coat, the pharynx has three muscles that run longitudinally, the stylopharynges that rises from the styloid process, palatopharynges that descends from the sides of the palate, and salpingopharynges that descends from the auditory tube to merge with the palatopharyngeus muscle. Now let's learn about the Killian's dehiscence through this diagram. In the posterior wall of the pharynx, the lower part of the thyropharyngeus is a single sheet of muscle, not overlapped internally by the superior and middle constrictors. This weak part lies below the level of the vocal folds or the upper border of the cricoid lamina and is limited inferiorly by the thick cricopharyngeal sphincter. Now this area is called uh, known as the Killian's dehiscence. The pharyngeal diverticula that you can see right here are formed by outpouching out of the dehiscence that is it outpouches out of the Killian's dehiscence. Now this pharyngeal diverticula are often attributed to neuromuscular coordination in this region which may be due to the fact that different nerves supply the two parts of the inferior constrictor muscle. If the cricopharyngeus muscle that you see right here fails to relax when the thyropharyngeus contracts, then the bolus of foot is pushed 
backwards and tends to produce a diverticulum. Concising the important points and the structures in between the pharyngeal muscles, looking at the Killian's dehiscence. In the posterior wall of the pharynx, the lower part of the thyropharyngeus is a single sheet of muscle, not overlapped internally by the superior and middle constrictors. This weak part lies below the level of the vocal folds or upper border of the cricoid lamina and is limited inferiorly by the cricopharyngeal sphincter. This area is known as the Killian's dehiscence. The pharyngeal diverticula are formed by outpouching of the dehiscence. Pharyngeal diverticula are often attributed to neuromuscular incoordination. If the cricopharyngeus fails to relax when the thyropharyngeus contracts, the bolus of foot is pushed backwards and tends to produce a diverticula. Now let's look at the nerve supply of the pharynx. The pharynx is supplied by the pharyngeal plexus of nerves which lie chiefly on the middle constrictor. The plexus is formed by the pharyngeal branch of the vagus nerve. As you can see this is the tracheal branches. Similarly there exist pharyngeal branches of the vagus nerve which supply the pharynx. Secondly there is the pharyngeal branches of the glossopharyngeal nerve. Here is the glossopharyngeal nerve and the pharyngeal, uh, pharyngeal branch of the glossopharyngeal nerve that you see right here. So this is the second. And thirdly, there is the pharyngeal branches of the superior cervical sympathetic ganglion. Now let's look at the blood supply of the pharynx. Firstly, there is the ascending pharyngeal artery that you see right here. Then comes the ascending palatine and tonsillar arteries. Then comes the dorsal lingual branches of the lingual artery right here and the greater palatine, pharyngeal and pterygoid branches of the maxillary artery. Concising the important points under the nerve supply and the blood supply, the pharynx is supplied by the pharyngeal plexus of nerves which lies chiefly on the middle constrictor. The plexus is formed by pharyngeal branch of vagus nerve, pharyngeal branches of glossopharyngeal nerve and pharyngeal branches of the superior cervical sympathetic ganglion. The blood supply is by the ascending pharyngeal branch of the external carotid artery, descending palatine and tonsillar branches of the facial artery, the dorsal lingual branches of the lingual artery, finally the greater palatine, pharyngeal and pterygoid branches of the maxillary artery. Now let's learn about the process of swallowing. The swallowing of food occurs in three stages. The muscles of the pharynx act during swallowing. Now let's look at the first stage. The first stage is voluntary in character. The anterior part of the tongue is raised and pressed against the hard palate by the intrinsic muscles of the tongue, especially the superior longitudinal and transverse muscles. The movement takes place from anterior to posterior side. This pushes the foot, uh, foot bolus into the posterior part of the oral cavity. Now the soft palate that you see right here closes down on the back of the tongue and helps to form the bolus. Next, the hyoid bone that you see right here is moved upwards and forwards by the suprahyoid muscles. The posterior part of the tongue is elevated upwards and backwards by the styloglossum. This pushes the bolus through the oropharyngeal isthmus to the oropharynx and the second stage begins. Now looking at the second stage, it is involuntary in character. During this stage, the foot is pushed from the oropharynx to the lower part of the laryngopharynx. The nasopharyngeal isthmus is closed by elevation of the soft palate by levator veli palatini and tensor veli palatini by the approximation of it to the posterior pharyngeal wall and this prevents the foot bolus from entering the nose. Now the inlet of the larynx is closed by approximation of the eriepiglottic folds by eriepiglottic and oblique arytenoid. This prevents the foot bolus from entering into the larynx. Nextly, the larynx and the pharynx are elevated behind the hyoid bone by the longitudinal muscles of the pharynx and the bolus is pushed down over the posterior surface of the epiglottis and the closed inlet of the larynx down by gravity and it enters into the esophagus. Now in the third stage, this is also an involuntary stage. In this stage, the foot passes from the lower part of the pharynx to the esophagus. This is brought about by inferior constrictors of the pharynx. I hope you found this video helpful. To get the notes of pharynx as well as other notes of anatomy, physiology, biomechanics, psychology, pathology and pharmacology, 
visit my Instagram page, the link to which is given in the description below. To get updates on my latest videos, click on the subscribe button. To get notifications, tap on the bell icon. Thank you for watching.